the end of the super jumbo dream, Airbus is killing off production of the A380 in two years' time. What does the demise of the world's biggest passenger plane tell us about the aviation industry? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Elizabeth Paranam. Passengers and pilots love it. Airline accountants dread paying the super-sized bills, which is why the A380 is having its wings clipped permanently. Airbus is pulling the plug on the world's largest passenger plane after its biggest customer, Emirates Airline, cancelled dozens of deliveries. When it first took off 14 years ago, Airbus hoped what it called its giant cruise liner in the sky would fly long into the 21st century. But 2021 is the date set for the final double-decker to roll off the production line in southern France. Thousands of jobs are threatened in the European aerospace industry, as Natasha Butler explains from Airbus HQ in Toulouse. Well, Airbus bosses here in Toulouse say that this is a very disappointing and painful moment for them. They have announced the end of the A380 uh, jet. They say it will end its production in 2021. Now, this is a plane that's called the Super Jumbo by aviation fans. It is the world's biggest passenger jet. It can carry more than 540 people. It's a double-decker, a feat of engineering. But over the years, it has been plagued by delays in delivery, rising costs and falling orders. The final blow, though, was the fact that the Dubai-based airline Emirates decided to reduce one of its orders by 39 planes, and that simply meant that the A380 could not survive. I think uh, what we're seeing here is uh, the end of a large four-engine aircraft and that is what it is. I mean there has been speculation uh, for years whether we were 10 years too early with 380. I think it becomes clear that we were probably at least 10 years too late or more but in retrospect it's, it's all easy. However let me stress one point here and I hope you appreciate because I know many of you love to fly on the 380. We're talking about the end of the production of the 380 in 2021. We're not talking about the end of a program. Obviously, Airbus will support these, what is it, 220-something aircraft that are in operation out there with many airlines. Well, back in 2005, when the A380 was first launched with lots of fanfare at the Paris Air Show, Airbus bosses said then that they hoped that this plane would revolutionise long-haul travel. The idea was a big plane that would carry the maximum amount of passengers from hub to hub. But over the years, the trend in aviation has actually been towards smaller planes, more fuel-efficient aircraft, and that's something that Airbus will now focus more on. In terms of the impact on the company, well, bosses say some 3,500 positions across uh, the European plane maker could be affected and they will be in talks with unions and representatives to see what will happen to those jobs in the future. Natasha Butler for Inside Story in Toulouse, France. Well, let's bring in our guest now. Joining us from Toulouse, where Airbus is headquartered, is aviation analyst Alex Macheras. David Learmount is the consulting editor for Flight Global, and he's joining us from London. And Andreas Whitmer is managing director at the Centre for Aviation Competence at the University of St. Gallen in Switzerland. A very warm welcome to all of you. Mr. Macheras, I'll start with you since you are in Toulouse. It was debuted with so much fanfare in 2005. Why do you think the A380 failed? Well, the A380 perhaps came a little too late. This is a marvel of an aircraft that was able to be the blank canvas to airlines wishing to install a lot of seating capacity in terms of passenger accommodation, but also be home to luxurious first-class cabins, onboard social areas and more. But ultimately, the production time that this aircraft actually tried to secure its place in the market the airlines woke up and started to tell the manufacturer, we want more efficient, smaller aircraft, as they worked out how their routes were performing, 
ultimately, these aircraft, like the A350, which are more up and coming, yeah. they have secured yeah. a better market share than the A380, and they are much younger. And as a result, the production has now come to an abrupt end. Mr. Learmount, we heard from uh, Airbus CEO who said that, you know, it was 10 years too late for the A380. It was supposed to revolutionise air travel. Did it find that the skies had moved on? Uh, well, the skies were always going to move on. Um, Airbus has done a great job with this aeroplane. It's going to be with us for a very long time. Emirates will be operating these aircraft for at least another 20 years and maybe another, 40, and, uh, maybe another 30 years because they are excellent. Uh, technically, they're brilliant and passengers absolutely love them. And they do carry an awful lot of people. But the only, the, the only routes they're very good for is the world's great trunk routes. Now, as it happens, some, most of the world's, well, a lot of the world's great trunk routes go straight through Dubai. So we're still going to see lots of A380s operating out of big hubs. But meanwhile, the smaller aeroplanes mm -hmm. have just as long range and they're more efficient so they can bypass the hubs and take people from their own local airports to exactly where they want to go. Mr Whitmer, Airbus says that the last A380s will be delivered in 2021. As uh, Mr Learmont has pointed out, Airbus is saying, um, Emirates rather, is saying that they're going to be using the A380 in to at least the 2030s. Do you think that that is likely? And how do they use it in a way that is economical? Yes, I think that's very likely. I mean, these planes uh, that are, have been delivered uh, just lately or will be delivered uh, until 2021 will probably be flying uh, in the next 20 years, even 25 years. Um, I also think that on the chunk routes where you have uh, a lot of passengers on, the, on those uh, big uh, global uh, transfer routes where the Middle Easterns especially are, are carrying passengers, uh, they will be able to... Uh, to, to use those planes as in the past uh, successfully. Um, but the industry as a whole will move towards more mm -hmm. uh, flights to also secondary airports to have more point-to-point -point and direct connections. Mr. Macheras, if the industry is moving towards more, um, as we say, point-to-point -point flights, what does that mean for the hub dream? You know, so many airlines like Emirates built the, built the industry around being a hub. Exactly. The hub and spoke model is very popular, especially in the Middle East. And you have uh, Dubai, Abu Dhabi and Doha who all specialize in bringing passengers into their terminals to be able to pass through and exit within an hour or two, predominantly on A380s, actually. But that hub and spoke model is a dying model. It's quite dated. And with the introduction of these new aircraft, ultimately, there is no real need to have to stop. Even the airlines who are based in the Gulf are waking up to this. Just last week, I was with the CEO of Qatar Airways. He exclusively revealed that he will only keep the A380s until the 10-year mark. And he told me after the 10-year mark, he's replacing those 380s with 777X by Boeing, which he feels is a far more superior jet in terms of efficiency and economics, which ultimately is the bottom line for every airline. And Mr. Learmount, what does that mean then for Airbus? How damaging is this for the airline? Well, it's damaging. It's uh, Frankly, um, because the numbers of the A380s are small, even though the individual cost of each aircraft is large, um, they're going to make a loss on, on, the, uh, on the project as a whole. And that, I reckon that is, that, that's being estimated at about, um, about $500 million. They will never recover. So it's a loss. But Airbus has just had its, uh, published its... Uh, its um, uh, third quarter figures uh, today, and they are extremely good. And what's more, at the same time as the uh, as, as Emirates announced that it was cancelling um, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, A380s, um, it, it put in a massive order for A330s and A350s. So Airbus is doing all right, thank you very much. It will survive this. And Mr Whitmer, what about the 3,000 to 3,500 um, worker, workers involved in the A380? Will they survive? And they're across countries. They're not just in Toulouse, they're also in Wales, um, they're in Hamburg, they're in Bristol. Well, I think that Airbus will have to think about how to use the infrastructures they have built uh, in the last uh, 
decade for, for the Airbus 380. And uh, as we see growth in the production of airplanes and growth in the market and growth for air airplanes like A350s and A330s, I think Airbus needs to figure out how to reuse those infrastructures and also those uh, educated employees. I think um, Airbus will try to keep as many of those uh, specialists um, for the further growth of the company. Uh, but you're never sure about uh, whether all can be, uh, be uh, staying with the company, of course. And Mr. Machir, as you touched on this earlier on how um, airlines, especially those that, you know, whose home countries are a hub, are going to manage the sort of changing trends in travel where people might not be likely to fly um, the super long haul or on, you know, jumbo jets like the A380 as much as more sort of point-to-point -point travel on smaller flights. So again, you know, how do they go about navigating these, these changes right now? Well, the airlines have been adapting to what is the current aviation climate in terms of the aircraft that they want already. An aircraft such as the Airbus A350, of course, manufactured here in Toulouse in the south of France, that A350 has already secured a lot of the market share that would have typically years ago have gone to the A380. So that's how airlines are preparing themselves. They're taking delivery of jets like the A350, or they take jets of the Boeing competition of the 777X, which should enter service this year. It could slip into next year. And ultimately, with that, through that new deliveries and through that new delivery cycle of these more efficient jets, they're able to improve their bottom line financials and they're able to look. And ultimately, the airlines that are still left with A380s plus the new A350s are becoming increasingly frustrated with the fact that their 350s perform superior in terms of efficiency and economics. But you should still hold the fact that that 380 is very much loved. And ultimately, when you speak to the average passenger and ask about that flight, I'm always inundated with messages of passengers who tell me their love for their 380 flights in all cabin classes. So the 380 will still, you know, hold that significant place in air travel, and it will still be around for many, many years to come. There are deliveries ongoing. This year, there will be eight A380 deliveries. Emirates will take another 14, and Japan's largest airline, ANA, they will be the first Japanese airline to take the A380 this year. So there are still milestones to come, but ultimately for production, it has always been a bleak outlook, at least for recent years. So it isn't the most unexpected news this morning here in Toulouse. Mr. Learmont, how do you think other airlines will be looking on at this news? Is it possibly even good news for, say, airlines like Air France, Lufthansa, that also invested in the A380, but you know, will they be relieved to see something like the A380 removed from Gulf rivals like Emirates, who they accuse of, of flooding the market? Uh, yes, they do, um, but then they would, wouldn't they? Um, no, I don't think it's going to make any, any real difference to, uh, uh, to these, because I think that the, um, the Gulf carriers will continue to use the A380s for a long time yet, so that competition is going to be there for Air France and co. Um, Air France doesn't have all that many um, uh, A380s, but it does have routes on which it can use them, um, the transatlantic routes, for example. Um, so, you know, the, 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 the routes through the Gulf are not the only one mm -hmm. of the world's trunk routes. There are trunk routes out of London, Frankfurt, um, Tokyo, uh, you know, which can support aircraft like these and the passengers absolutely love them. And Mr. Whitmer, do you think that if we're moving, you know, away from the trunk routes, why are we seeing um, a greater demand for more efficient aircraft in the trend of aviation? Well, um, what I think is that well, we see a lot of growth, especially coming from the uh, area of Asia uh, Pacific, and maybe in the future also towards the south, towards um, Africa. So um, I do see some of the chunk routes um, between, for example, Africa and, uh, and uh, Asia in the future. They are seen now on the area between Europe and, and Asia, for example. And I think that um, these routes will still grow and uh, we have limited capacities of airports, especially in Europe. We are not uh, constructing enough let's say, runways to, to grow. And so there is uh, an argument for the big planes for the next mm -hmm. decade or so. And uh, that's also when the A380 will still be in, uh, in operation. 
Uh, Mr. Machera, so the A380, as you know, you've all made the point, it will remain in operation, but also um, smaller, more efficient planes are going to be used more and more, as we've seen from um, the recent orders. Why do you, again, why do you think there is that trend towards using smaller, more efficient planes? Ultimately, there are a variety of reasons. I mean, the A380 itself leaves a lot of availability for empty seats. So in terms of load factor, it is a riskier jet to operate because ultimately with more seats leaves more uh, opportunity for not selling enough tickets and having to fly half empty. And that's a risk that airlines want to mitigate. But the main overriding risk in all of this isn't necessarily the aircraft itself. It's not the design. It's not the aerodynamics. It's the engines. And given that the A380 has four engines that are not the most efficient nowadays in 2019, they were when the A380 was first introduced, but compared with the offerings of Rolls-Royce and similar engine manufacturers now in 2019, these engines do not weigh up. And airlines were very vocal over the last five years and said to Airbus, if they were able to offer a re-engine version of the A380 that basically had the efficiencies of what aircraft like the A350 enjoy, then they would be more inclined to buy. But Airbus say that the business case for a NEO, a new engine option, A380, was not something that they could get their heads around. It wasn't something that they thought met their financials, and they didn't think it would ensure profitability. So it's a, a kind of rare circumstance where the manufacturer really disagreed with what the airlines were asking for, because typically they just, they just listen and do as they say. And ultimately, here we are with no re-engined A380 and no orders as a result. And Mr. Learmont, do you think that um, Boeing, you know, there is a great rivalry between Airbus and Boeing. Have they, have they gained where Airbus has lost? Have they met the sort of market's demands better than Airbus has? Um, I don't think they have. I mean, both of, the, uh, both of those companies are really prospering. Um, they both have a superb range of products, but there's no question about it regarding the A380. Boeing predicted in the 1990s when the A380 was under development that the, world, the, wor the way the world networks was going to change, uh, and it would go more and more point to point, and therefore Boeing decided not to do a successor mega jumbo to its Boeing uh, 747. However, it did upgrade its 747 in what's now known as the 747-8, and that is still in production, and it's not going to be cancelled. But the numbers coming off the line are rather smaller than they used to be, and almost all of them are going as uh, being purchased as pure freighters, uh, which is not too surprising mm -hmm. because originally the Boeing 747 was made as a military freighter mm. and developed into what we now know. And um, Mr Whitmer, you know, when the 747 did fall out of favour there for a while, it was used, I believe, um, for cargo, but that's just not feasible, is it, with the A380? Well, uh, I think Airbus has another product for, for cargo um, uh, called the Beluga, which they also, for, for very big um, uh, freight and special shaped freight, they are selling. Um, I do not think that uh, there is a need for focusing on, on cargo with the A380. Mr. Macheras, um, how much of the demand do you think the sort of smaller planes that we've been talking about, how much of the demand is being driven by the sort of um, rise of low-cost budget carriers? Sure. Just, just before, I just want to clarify that one point. The Airbus Beluga is actually an in-house Airbus transporter only between the Airbus sites. It's a common misconception. That's not actually a, uh, a cargo jet for sale. That's just within Airbus. So it's not part of that cargo jet portfolio. But uh, to answer your question, in terms of demand uh, for low cost, the threat of low cost airlines, airlines admit, full service airlines admit, that they didn't take them seriously enough years ago. And now when low cost long haul is booming more than it ever has before, and we have operators all over the world in every continent from Europe doing transatlantic to Asia and subsidiaries of airline brands that are so famous. Singapore Airlines offer a low cost long haul 
airline called Scoot that is a quarter, a fraction of the price of a regular Singapore Airlines ticket, airlines are still focused on that bottom line more than ever. As the cost of air travel is being driven down, ultimately the airlines have tighter margins. They need to find new and creative ways, mm -hmm. basically, to become more profitable. And who's doing well, Mr. Learmount, you know, with, um, with the price of travel going down and with the rise of budget airlines? Are the budget airlines doing better than um, the more traditional carriers? <clears throat> well, they're, they're all doing quite well at the moment. I mean, if you look at the world as a whole, the big picture is this. Um, for all the bad news we hear about conflict and, and, uh, you know, and economic problems between America and China, the world is gradually getting richer. People are gradually getting a higher disposal, uh, disposable income. And one of the first things that people do when they get above basically survival wages, one of the first things they spend their money on is air travel. They want to go places. And so air travel is booming when everything, when a lot of other industries are struggling. So the airlines and the aircraft manufacturers are all doing well, meeting this ever-increasing demand mm -hmm. for which nobody sees at the moment uh, any sign of a downturn. So everybody's happy, low-cost carriers and the traditional carriers too. And Mr Whitmer, if you know everyone in the industry is doing well, if, as Mr Learmount says, both Boeing and Airbus are doing well and airlines, whether they're budget or more traditional carriers, are doing well, I mean, how do you compete in an industry like that where there is so much demand for travel? Um, I may not agree. I mean, not all uh, airlines do well. I mean, especially in Europe, we have seen a few bankruptcies the last uh, couple of years, and especially this year already. Um, so I think the, the big uh, network airlines, or let's say the more traditional airlines of the past, are doing uh, rather well. And, and especially low-cost airlines on a regional scale are doing also uh, very well. Uh, if you look at low-cost airlines going on the medium haul to long haul, then the numbers don't look as promising than uh, on the short haul. So there are challenges in the industry, of course. And uh, if uh, we assume further um, increases in, in fuel prices in the future, they may be challenged um, uh, with their costs again and the uh, rather low prices that the demand, uh, well, demands on the market uh, will be a challenge uh, for them. So I, I do see a, a challenging industry that mm -hmm. is doing rather well at the moment. Um, but uh, the growth of the, uh, let's say, the growth of the industry, or the growth of demand is also needed to have success in the future. And Mr. Um Macheras, how do you see the industry, the state of the industry at the moment and what it means for, you know, for travellers and for consumers? It's, it's very fragmented and if you divide it up into divisions, as the previous gentleman just said, here in Europe we have a very big problem with consolidation but also with overcapacity. There is simply too much capacity within Europe. There are too many airlines flying the same route and the current fare price level, the current cost of being able to fly, let's say from here in France to Italy, is not sustainable. It's not sustainable for any airlines. And this is why we often see airlines collapse, because combine that with a globally high fuel price, it's calmed down quite a bit since the new year. But 2018 was really the year that airlines answered to the fluctuating oil price. It has been a very turbulent and, and unstable 12 months. But on the whole, the airlines that were already doing well are mm -hmm. prospering, and those that were fragile have either disappeared or they've merged up with another fragile player to form a semi-stable airline. Mr. Learmont, we've only got about 30 seconds left, and I'll give you um, the last line. That's, the, that, that's a picture of the last 12 months in the industry. How do you see the next 12? I, I don't see um, any great changes. I, I think this, this A380 demise, the, the, the news story, it's big, but... All of us in the industry were expecting it. It's, mm -hmm. it's not a surprise to anybody. And least of all, it's not a surprise to the airlines. They're ready for the future the way it's going to be. All right, Mr Learmount, thank you very much for that. And we'll have to end it on that note, ready for the future. I'd like to thank all of our guests. That is um, Alex Macheras in Toulouse, David Learmount in London, and Andreas Whitmer 
and St. Gallen. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, do go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Elizabeth Puranam, and the whole team here in Doha. Bye for now.